Good morning. My name is Callie, and I bring you greetings from Sermon in the Park in Victoria, Texas. And we just want to let you know that we have been praying for you and that we've been praying for this conference and for God's word to go out to affect people and motivate Christians in particular to stand on his word in this chaotic world that we live in. Um, I'm not very technologically advanced, and this is my first PowerPoint ever, so um, bear with me as I, I push buttons. <laughs> I'm going to start by reading Psalm 82. So if you would stand for the reading of God's word. This is Psalm 82. God takes his stand in his own congregation. He judges in the midst of the rulers. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. Vindicate the weak and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them out of the hands of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, and all of you are sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, you will die like men and fall like any one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for it is you who possesses all the nations. Let's pray. Our most kind and gracious triune God, we are so grateful that you have sent your son to redeem sinners and bring unto himself a people where you will be to them, God, and they will be to you, your people. May it please you today to make your presence known, that you would open up our eyes and, and encourage us to stand on your truth and hear your word and boldly stand with you as you conform us more into the image of your son by renewing our mind and bringing us back into conformity to your word. We love you and we just ask for your mercy and grace. That's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The title of my lecture today, as you can see on the screen, is Being More Loving, Compassionate, and Wiser Than God. While certainly a case could be made for this title's application to the secular pro-life movement and all of their doctrines in general, the focus of my talk will specifically be on the doctrine of the woman as the second victim of abortion. Simply put, this second victim doctrine states that women who unjustly kill their own preborn children by way of abortion should not be considered perpetrators in this act of criminal homicide, but rather should be thought of as second victims of the crime of abortion. The second victim doctrine is one of the uncompromising doctrinal pillars of the secular pro-life establishment. And you hear it in the slogans and in the taglines that the pro-life movement says, for example, pro-life, pro-woman, compassion and love for child and mother, pro-life feminist, abortion hurts both mother and child. Well, over the past several years, it's become more and more apparent that this doctrine in particular is going to be one of the hardest obstacles for us to overcome as we seek to criminalize abortion and apply equal justice. Here in Texas, in the, in the last legislative session back in April of last year, many of us here were at the state capitol giving testimony for a bill of equal justice. There were 800 people that showed up in favor of this bill and 500 registered to testify on behalf of this bill. And we were given one minute 
a person. And the testimony went throughout the night until somewhere around 3 o'clock in the morning. But it was on this point in particular, on the prosecution of women that unjustly kill their own preborn children, that the professing Christian committee chair, Jeff Leach, he used to kill that bill. As we are out on the streets, when, when I go to university campuses, when I go talk to Christians at churches, when, when I go and talk to people just out on the street, this doctrine right here is where I get the most pushback. Anytime I try to discuss equal justice, this doctrine coming from the pro-life movement is the hardest one for them to overcome. The Bible on which we as believers in Jesus Christ stand is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. We get our clues, we get our cues, we, we learn how to live our lives based off of the Bible. Scripture is clear as to the position of Jesus Christ when it comes to the particular secular doctrine. Yet even Christians and churches, when you show them the biblical grounding of equal justice, the more majority of them will side with the lies of this doctrine that women are the victim. And it's usually by leveraging an unbiblical understanding of love and compassion. Now, the light of nature is the revelation of God in creation. And it is fruitful in shutting the mouth of the fool and destroying all of their arguments, all of their objections to equal justice, as you expose the inconsistencies of their logic in the women that are second victims and their ideology. Yet even so, even when you destroy all of their arguments and you show all of their inconsistencies and you ground the truth of equal justice in the Bible, the cognitive dissonance is so strong and, and this doctrine is so entrenched in the lives of even believers that they will leave the discussion unswayed. And oftentimes they will make accusations against proponents of equal justice saying that we don't understand the gospel, saying that we hate women, that we are targeting them for execution, that we lack wisdom, mercy, compassion, and love. Due to the limited time that I have for this lecture, I will not be addressing the arguments and their objections to equal justice. So let me commend to you a couple of resources. The first is going to be notavictim.com, and there's that little sideways dash in between not and a. This is a website that's put together by Rusty Thomas and Christine Harhoff, and they've done an excellent job. On it, you'll find a bunch of videos of women at the clinics or out on the street. You'll have a bunch of blog articles that will go through various argumentation. And then we'll all push you back to the frequently asked questions. And that's where the bulk of the resource has its benefit. Also, if you go to abolishabortiontexas.org, they have a table out here, and Bradley Pierce is going to be doing a, a lecture. Uh, I would commend to you some of their YouTube videos. Um, Bradley does an excellent job outlining what equal justice is and some of the arguments that he completely demolishes um, in those videos. I have a chapter in my book, Doctrine of Balaam, that deals with women as a second victim. Also, I've done a couple of moderated debates. One of them you can find on uh, According to Christ. There, they hosted it, and that was about a year and a half ago, two years ago, with Scott Mehern on this. And, and you will see some of their argumentation and how 
inconsistent it is. Also, I host a podcast called Resisting Balaam, and we have a couple of episodes that deal with this. So rather than dealing with the arguments and objections to equal justice, what I'm going to be doing is showing the positive from the Bible, why we are to stand on equal justice and deny this doctrine. But I want to make a couple of distinctions as I begin. It's very important that we acknowledge the difference between the average professing Christian pro-life person and the establishment secular pro-life organizations. We need to make a distinction between these two. The average professing Christian and unfortunately even pastors have never been educated on a consistent Christian ethic when it comes to women that kill their own children. And so we ought to reason with them and do so with grace and walk with them through the scripture. But when it comes to the leadership in secular pro-life organizations and the legislators that they handle, they have been instructed, they have been taught, and we need to stand stronger against them with stronger rhetoric. They oppose the clear biblical teaching and need to be dealt with more firmly. Now, this would also include some of the more outspoken pastors and leadership in Christian denominations and associations that give them cover. But we need to remember that people have not been educated. So when they come to you with honest questions, really trying to figure this out, we need to, with grace, walk with them, answering their questions, pointing them to Scripture, and be very patient because we didn't know at one time either. The, the paradigm on this is shifting. The, the mindset of Christians is shifting to a more biblical ideology. So we need to be prepared to help educate. We need to build them up in truth and teach them and not constantly be tearing down idols, even if those idols are there to obstruct and hinder, hinder righteousness. So I want to be fair to the secular pro-life establishment. This doctrine of uh, the woman as the second victim of abortion did not start with them, though they willingly continue to propagate this ideology of partiality and injustice, and they weave it into every aspect of pro-life movement. Historically, it has been the position of the states in this union to treat women that kill their own preborn children through abortion differently than any other perpetrator of any other form of criminal homicide. Now, this in part is due to the laws of cooperating testimony, science, and technology. This disparity in consequences, and by that I mean the fact that we do not prosecute them but we prosecute all other people for all other forms of criminal homicide. This, this disparity in consequence for this type of criminal homicide is in part what led to the unconstitutional Roe versus Wade decision. But we have these advancements now in technology, in science, embryology, and these advancements have made that argumentation obsolete. However, the secular pro-life establishment has taken hold of this doctrine and doubled down in order to justify that disparity and make legislation palatable for society in general and Christians in particular. They are now responsible for indoctrinating the American population on this doctrine. And so now carrying their torch, the secular pro-life establishment holds tight this doctrine of the woman as the second victim of abortion who should not be prosecuted for the act of criminal homicide. I told you I wasn't good at this.
Can you make it go to the next slide? <laughs> So in, in 2016, when um, President Trump was running for president, right, we need to recognize that, that Donald Trump is pro-choice. Ideologically, he doesn't care, all right? He is pro-choice. Now, when he started running as a Republican for president, his base is pro-life, right? So that means he's going to be pro-life. Now, he didn't understand all of the nuances, and he hadn't been inculcated by the pro-life movement as to what was what. But he's a smart guy. So in his head, he argued this way. If we believe that this baby is a human, and you can't unjustly kill humans because they're created in the image of God, what do you do to somebody who kills unjustly? a human created in the image of God. So at this town hall meeting, he uses that logic correctly. And they ask him, should you prosecute women that have abortion? And he says, of course. Well, there was a huge backlash from the news and especially from pro-life organizations. And this is a quote from Scott Klusendorf, and he is a professing Christian. He is the president of Life Institute, Life Training Institute. And this is what he wrote in response. It's really important. We're going to try to break this down a little bit. But again, even if pro-lifers are inconsistent on the issue of consequences, how would that in any way prove that the unborn are not human or that intentionally killing them is justified? At best, it proves that individual pro-lifers are failing to consistently apply their ethic. Now, he's not saying that they are inconsistent, but he's saying if they are consistent. If, if we're inconsistent in consequences, and by that mean, if we prosecute all principal actors, accomplices, and co-conspirators in criminal homicide, except for this one instance, that that's the, the inconsistency, right, in consequence. If we're inconsistent in that, how does that prove that that child that is killed is not human? Or that killing them is unjust? And he's right, except that's exactly how the Roe versus Wade judges argued. We're going to look at some of that argumentation. The secular pro-life establishment is inconsistent on the issue of consequences. And these inconsistencies in the issue of consequences had a large impact on the unjust Roe versus Wade ruling. Reading the trial transcripts and the decision demonstrates that the judges in 1973 argued and made their decision in the way that Scott Kalusendorf denies. So I'm going to read a, a, a portion of the decision, okay? This is from the Roe versus Wade decision. It says, when Texas argues that a fetus is entitled to the 14th Amendment protection as a person, it faces a dilemma. Neither in Texas nor in any other state are all abortions prohibited, right? So what they were trying to argue is, due to the 14th Amendment, this child, this human, as a person with all of the constitutional rights, right, to, to life, liberty, and due process, right? But what the Supreme Court is saying to Texas, if you actually believe that, then why do you have all these exceptions in your pro-life laws? Because you're, you're, you're now not allowing due process for the child, but you're, you're valuing that child based off of the mother. Right, so, so there's this disparity there where, where not everybody has due process. You're, you're allowing the one person, mother, priority over another without due process. That, that's the argument that, that he's making. But now to the, the argument that's attached to that, which is um, what Scott Klusendorf is wrong about. There are other, and I'm still reading from the Roe versus Wade decision. There are other inconsistencies between the 14th Amendment statutes and the typical abortion statute. 
It has already been pointed out that tex in Texas, the woman is not a principal or accomplice with respect to an abortion upon her. If the fetus is a person, why is the woman not a principal or an accomplice? Right? If, if, if the, the, the child that the woman kills is actually a human, why aren't you charging the woman? Why, why is there a, an inconsistency in, in consequence? And the penalty for criminal abortion specified by the name of the law is significantly less than the maximum penalty for murder in the Texas Penal Code. If the fetus is a person, why are the penalties different? You, you see, the judges argued exactly what Scott Klusendorf said you can't do. But that's how we ended up with this Roe versus Wade decision, because of our inconsistency in consequences. The judges said to Texas, it does prove that this is not a human. And it does justify the intentional killing of that human. The justices reason that the lack of consistent consequences does prove that the unborn are not only human, but intentionally killing them is justified. Now let's, go, let's move to the second part of his, his statement. But again, even if pro-lifers are inconsistent with the issue of consequences, at best, it proves that the individual pro-lifer is failing to consistently apply their ethic. He's saying that if you, as an individual pro-lifer, are inconsistent, if you hold to this doctrine of the woman as the second victim, if you are inconsistent in your idea of consequence, then what you are is you are failing to consistently apply your ethic. And I agree with him. Failing to consistently apply your ethic is a euphemism for sin. Sin is any want or conformity or transgression to the law of God. As priests in the kingdom of God, we are required to consistently apply a Christian ethic, which is the Word of God, to all of our dealings in this world. And this includes how we seek justice, apply justice, and fight injustice. God calls it sin when we are not faithful to apply the mind of Christ in a Christian ethic consistently. And he calls us to repent. Next slide, please. <laughs> the second victim ideology undergirds every part of the legislative strategy to the secular pro-life establishment and every pro-life law that has been written or passed in the past four decades. And this is how the secular pro-life establishment has been so successful in indoctrinating generations of Americans, including professing Christians, some of which are pastors and their congregation. The law is a tutor. Next slide, please. Morality is taught to society through law. Right? The law restrains evil. But we teach morality through law. One of the functions of law is to legislate morality, to train its members of society that in that it governs, that it's to train the members of the society that it governs what is acceptable and what is unacceptable within the boundaries of the authority of that law. Laws explain to the population what actions the government sanctions. And by that, I mean grants or gives official permission within the borders of its authority. So as an aside, this is also one of the failures of the secular pro-life incremental legislation strategy. For generations, the pro-life laws have been teaching the country to be pro-life. But what people mean by that is that they want abortion legal through the first trimester. Even polls as recent as last year, and, and they touted out like 75% of Americans are pro-life. Well, what it means is 75% of the people 
want it legislated in the first trimester at various ranges. Some go to a heartbeat, some go to 20 weeks. But the vast majority of them accept rape, incest. There's only about 10% that want it criminalized and about 10% that want it full on. Next slide, please. So what has the pro-life reg regulation laws taught us about women as victims in prosecution? My assertion is that decades of defying equal justice and promoting the second victim of abortion doctrine through pro-life legislation has taught Americans to be more compassionate, more loving than our creator in our words and in our actions, and in doing so, we have made ourselves out to be wiser than God. Let me say that again so you can really get the importance of this implication. Decades of defying equal justice and promoting this second victim of abortion doctrine through pro-life legislation has taught Americans, and Christians in particular, to be more compassionate more loving than our Creator in our words and in our actions, and in doing so, have made ourselves out to be wiser than God. Next slide, please. This second victim ideology has been the foundation of laws in every state, removing any type of prosecution for women that kill their own preborn children for any reason, for any method, up into birth. In every single state, a woman can kill her unborn child for any reason that she wants to, by any method, all the way up until birth, in every single state. She will not be prosecuted for criminal homicide. The, the, the laws are geared towards what the abortion doctor is allowed to do and what charges he will face. But the woman herself is removed from the entire judicial um, procedures. She can unjustly kill her preborn child for any reason that she wants to, all the way up until birth. Next slide, please. Here's an example from our state in Texas. Chapter 19 of the Texas Penal Code deals with criminal homicide, right? And it starts out like this. A person commits criminal homicide if they intentionally, knowingly, recklessly, or with criminal negligence cause the death of an individual. Now, in 2009, the, the definition of individual was changed, and that happens in Chapter 1 of the penal code, and I'm gonna to read to you the definition of individual, so you know who's being talked about as far as the death of that individual. Individual means a human being who is alive, including an unborn child, at every stage of gestation from fertilization until birth. So this is this part of the criminal homicide code so that we can have fetal homicide laws, right? So, so if, I, if I attack a woman who's pregnant and that child dies, I can be charged with criminal homicide, right? So after this statement, the, the criminal homicide laws break down into the various forms of criminal homicide, whether it's murder, manslaughter, criminally negligent homicide. And, and it tells you what the requirements for each one of these are. Right? And, and the basic generic distinction between each form happens to deal with what's called the mens rea, the, the intention and the knowledge that the perpetrator has about the crime that they're going to commit. Right? So, so the charge that the DA puts on a person is going to be based off of how much knowledge they have about the crime that they're going to commit and the intention. Right? That's what's going to separate the premeditated murder from manslaughter or driving a car drunk. Right? Next slide, please. At the end of this criminal homicide code, you have 
exceptions, right? What are not going to be considered homicide or criminal homicide. Now, there are going to be exceptions for a doctor that does his homicidal acts as long as he does them within a lawful medical procedure, which is going to be outlined in the health code. IVF doctors, scientists, and pharmacists that hand out the pill. But I want to focus on, on the first one, right? And it says this in 19.6. This chapter does not apply to the death of an unborn child if... Right? So criminal homicide includes unborn children in every stage of development from fertilization on. But it will not count if the conduct committed by the mother of the unborn child. She's not going to be prosecuted for criminal homicide because of that law. That's a pro-life law that officially sanctions the unjust killing of the preborn child if it's the mother that's responsible for the killing. This secular pro-life doctrine of the woman as the second victim has targeted women that kill their own preborn children as the only demographic that is exempt from prosecution for any type of criminal homicide. Next slide, please. It is because of our, excuse me. So women are, are, have been targeted by the pro-life movement to be the only demographic that is removed from the judicial system for any type of criminal homicide. So wiser than God, we apply unequal weights and measures to this form of criminal homicide. We use unequal scales. God calls that an abomination. We show partiality to this perpetrator over and against all other perpetrators. God tells us that when we judge, we're to judge without partiality. Not show partiality to the rich, but also not show partiality to the poor. But to apply laws equally to every instantiation of that violation, regardless of who the perpetrator is. So we act wiser than God when we apply these unequal weights and measures, and it is an abomination is what he calls it. And it is because of our great love and compassion for women that exceeds that of Almighty God that the state sanctions or grants permission to women to kill their own preborn children with no fear of judicial consequence. So we ought to join with the prophets and the Christians of the past that warn the Romans 13 deacon of God not to wield the sword of justice and fame. And this is why I began with Psalm 82. We should be going to our civil magistrate and speaking on behalf of God what he says to them in Psalm 82. It starts out with, with God taking his stand in his own congregation, and he is judging the rulers of the world. He is holding them to account for what they did as his sword-bearing deacon. And this is the indictment that's levied against him. And this is the indictment that you, as a Christian, ought to take to your civil magistrate. He says, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked, Selah? We should be going to our civil magistrates and saying, how long will you judge unjustly? How long will you fail to apply the laws that you have on criminal homicide to every person that commits criminal homicide? How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Who's the wicked person in this whole circumstance? Is it the child? No, it's, it's the woman that unjustly kills her own preborn child. That's the wicked. 
Stop showing partiality to the wicked. This is the indictment that we need to bring to the civil magistrate. How long will you, sword-bearing deacon of God, judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked woman that kills her own preborn child? And then God tells them what they ought to be doing. So this is what we need to remind our, our civil magistrate. Vindicate the weak and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. That's what they ought to be doing. Judging with equal weights and measures. With equal scales. Without partiality. That's what we need to remind our civil magistrates. We need to go to them as a mouthpiece of God, levying this same charge of injustice and partiality, and remind them of their duty to judge with equal scales, warning them that God will judge. Over and over again, you you will read what an abomination it is to judge with partiality. Abominations pollute the land and cause the land to vomit them up. And that is what's happening to our country right now. Next slide, please. So this brings us to the very unfortunate effect of the second victim ideology when we discuss implementing equal justice and calling for the state to repent. So for nearly 50 years, the secular pro-life establishment has been targeting women that kill their own preborn children as the only demographic that should not be prosecuted for committing any form of criminal homicide. And because of that, we are forced to have the conversation and this discussion in the terms of the mother. But the truth is, we want equal justice. You know, when, when I talk about this, one of the first things people say is, well, what about the, the father? I'm, I'm not excluding him. We want justice for all principal actors, all accomplices, all co-conspirators. But because the pro-life movement has targeted women, we are forced to have the discussion in terms of the woman. And that's very unfortunate because we'd rather have the conversation in terms of equal justice. Next slide, please. Our argument for equal justice is really simple. You can't commit criminal homicide, right? You can't unjustly kill a human because humans are created in the image of God. And God calls for retributive justice. When life is taken, life must be paid in restitution, right? God God demands retributive justice. And we recognize this in every form of criminal homicide that we have, except for this one. All principal actors, co-conspirators, and accomplices involved in the commission of any form of criminal homicide should face prosecution with due process. That's all we're asking for. We're asking for the, the laws of criminal homicide to be placed on every single form of criminal homicide that all of the actors of every single form of criminal homicide have due process. That a very particular demographic is not removed from the judicial system completely, right? Next slide, please. So when I say prosecution, can I have the next one? Okay, when I say prosecution, I'm not just talking about conviction and penalty. That's generally what people think I'm saying, but I'm not. I'm talking about the entire process, where uh, evidence is being gathered, given to a district attorney who looks at the evidence and based off of the evidence sees if there is intention and knowledge to commit this crime. And if so, what crime? What, What form of criminal homicide? Do they fall under? The Bible makes it clear that there is a difference between murder and manslaughter. That is a a righteous thing to do. Not every unjust killing is the same. 
but every instantiation of it must be judged equally, right? So the DA collects the, the, the evidence. Is there even a crime here? And if there's not, they have discretion to not charge a person. If there is a crime, they choose what charge to bring based off of the evidence. And then there's a trial by, by a jury of your peers where both sides present the evidence and the jury decides the, the innocence and guilt. That's what we're asking for. We're asking for the judicial process to do what it was designed to do and not remove a whole section of people out of the process. So I, I'm, I'm not saying that commit an abortion, you're instantly guilty. No, we believe in due process, okay? So our argument is simple. You cannot unjustly kill a human because humans are created in the image of God. And all principal actors, co-conspirators, and accomplices involved in the commission of any form of criminal homicide should face prosecution with due process. These are the terms of the conversation that we would like to have. But because of the generational indoctrination through the laws that are training us that women that kill their own preborn children are, are victims and that they should be the only demographic that is removed from the judicial process. And that's usually where the conversation happens, and that's unfortunate. The framing of this conversation, because of the cultural indoctrination, ultimately, public perception falsely can be made to look like the straw men accusations of those seeking equal justice as hatefully attacking vulnerable women. Next slide. And targeting them for execution. It's going to take time and patience on our part to educate without getting sidetracked off the focus of equally applying justice to all principal actors, co-conspirators, and accomplices. And we need to do this with uncompromising firmness, but with grace. Even though we have the truth, Bible, on our side, and we have evidence, we have logic, we have the light of nature on our side, Managing the perception of the population that has been taught by the pro-life establishment and their laws for generations is going to be difficult because they have taught Christians to put their Bible down and to be more compassionate than God, be more wise than God, and be more loving than God by removing these women out of the judicial process. As I come to an end, I want to remind everybody that we should have compassion. We should have love. We should be wise in our decisions. But that's not it. That is a lie, because God has told us how to love. He has told us how to be compassionate, and it's in that that we find wisdom. Everything that I've talked about up until now has all been about civil punishments. It's all been about the, the sword-bearing deacon of God who should not wield his sword in vain and, and how we should ap approach them. We better not conflate that with the forgiveness that is offered to all sinners. Jesus Christ entered into his own creation to destroy the works of the devil, to live a life of perfect righteousness, because none of us live that. His obedience led him to a cross where he took upon himself the sins of all those that would come to him. 
It pleased the Father to crush him as he drank the wrath that they deserve. There is forgiveness. We need to come around women that have had abortions, point them to Christ, and and let them know you are forgiven. Hold on to Christ. Trust in him. That's love and compassion. Walk through that with them. Men that have forced their women, men that have paid for it, abortion workers. Is there forgiveness for them? Do we pray for them? We we can't get this twisted, the, the difference between judicial, civil punishment and the forgiveness and freedom that we have in Christ. One's civil. And God has told us how we ought to respond to our civil magistrate. They have the light of nature. They know that they are to judge impartially. But you as a Christian have the word of God. Remind them of their duty and show love and compassion to women. Share the gospel with them. Walk with them. I didn't have an opportunity to deal with any of these arguments or implications or objections. So just write down on one of those cards. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Come and find me. All of the answers to any objection that you can bring up is very easy. The answers are super easy. The problem is it's hard for us. God is very clear on this. He's very simple about it. The problem is we don't like it. Right? So I pray that God opens up our eyes, that he convicts us and gives us strength to stand on his word regardless of what the world tells us. Let's pray. Most kind and gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that you have given us and we thank you for the word that you have shared with us. May it grow bright in our hearts and in our minds as we take upon Christ's mind and walk around this world with a redeemed image where we hold fast to you and seek to obey. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.